good evening, and thanks for joining us again for another edition of the Eco Review. This is a live, hour-long journal focused on environmental factors, um, events, and news impacting all of us in California and well out across the web reach. Uh, you know, we do stream live on the internet now, and you're able to get your friends who don't have a TV. I never watch that thing. Well, you can have them watch. It's just www.communitytv.org backslash ctv3. You'll see that address. So let them know this is a program they're going to want to see and make sure their friends see. It's uh, really exciting to have our guests tonight. I'm going to get right to introductions here and share with you. Um, I think a lot of our viewers will remember back in November, we were fortunate enough to connect with um, expert witness and nuclear engineer Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds and Associates. And Arnie uh, has done just yeoman's work in keeping us abreast of developments in Japan, uh, information TEPCO and Japanese government wasn't uh, making available for us. And uh, really, the, the core uh, components, if you will, for uh, nuclear power and how they go awry even when uh, they're invented or designed and developed by supposed and, and, and expert peoples. So we have Arnie back on tonight. He's going to be talking with us for uh, updates on Fukushima and something a whole lot closer to home. And um, we'll get into that shortly in the program. But I'm also delighted to have in, in the studio with me tonight uh, David Bloom. A lot of our viewers will recognize Dave. He's been on the program before. It takes time to come in and fill us in on things that he's working on. And Dave, there is a, a real intersection here between um, you and Fukushima. I know George Nuri of Coast to Coast AM had you on last year repeatedly to give updates on developments there. Well, yes, Tom. Uh, we scientists, you know, all kind of uh, get on the phone and talk to each other. And my uh, colleagues in Japan were saying, you guys are not hearing the whole story. So, you know, I was uh, doing my best to transmit on the ground information to the American media, which, you know, was kind of negligent in getting the word out to people. And, you know, there is, there is no over the fence. You know, everyone is downwind of everyone else. And so you couldn't really say that, ah, oh, it's Japan's problem, because if it's Japan's problem, it's our problem. Winds circle the globe and so do the oceans. So, you know, it was important for us to know what really was going on there and what wasn't being told either to the Japanese or to the Americans. I, uh, Arnie, are you on there with us? Can you hear me this evening? I can hear you crystal clear. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure to reconnect with you. And I, uh, you know, I, I don't know that you've had a chance to talk with David, but I really look forward to the exchange and dialogue between the two of you as, as the scientists and experts in, in tonight's program. And the work that you have done and you and Maggie and Fairwinds have been dedicated to here in the last year is just really exciting. I am sure there must be some incredible pressures on you to maybe discontinue this uh, course of research. It's, it's probably one of those things that uh, you don't get a lot of governmental sort of support for doing. Is that correct? Well, you know, when, when the accident at Fukushima Daiichi happened, I said, I am not going to let this get covered up. Um, and, uh, you know, our business, the, the, the billable portion of our business dropped way off. But I just thought it was so important for the world that just had the story had to come out and had to come out consistently for a long enough period of time uh, because, yeah, you're right, mainstream media was, uh, was covering it up. And, you know, it's interesting because I think there is an intersection between what David and I are doing. The, uh, the book I wrote on, um, in Japanese in Japan is called Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth, which talks about the accident and the future which talks about the fact that there are alternatives and we don't have to build more nuclear plants to satisfy our energy demand. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, excellent. Well, let's get right to uh, some of this. And I'm going to remind our viewers real quickly, you'll see the phone number up here. It's 425-8844 and area code 831. Uh, we do welcome or invite your question or call, but um, Arnie, what have you seen recently? Because Dave and I uh, have both seen different pieces of news about Fukushima. What, what's most uh, do you think is be, 
being uh, covered up the best and is most important for us to recognize? Is it, is it all done? Everything clean up now? The, uh, on, the, on the Daiichi site, the, the worst problem is Unit 4 and the fuel pool issues there. Um, through two Japanese ambassadors, uh, they've finally gotten some worldwide attention. Uh, Bob Alvarez, Gordon Edwards, and I have been working with uh, Ambassador Akio Matsumura for over a year now. And finally, uh, the world understands that, uh, that, that Unit 4 um, actually uh, still has the potential to create an even worse accident than what we experienced a year ago. So now Tokyo Electric is finally beginning to say um, what we've been saying now for over a year, and that's that you've got to get the fuel out of Unit 4 just as quickly as possible. Unit 3 isn't too far behind. It's kind of interesting. Nobody talks about Unit 3. But it had a one-third full core offload, so there was uh, quite a lot of hot nuclear fuel in Unit 3's fuel pool, too. So, no, the, the site isn't out of the woods. But the, the other problem, of course, is uh, Tokyo Electric doesn't have the money, and the Japanese government is drizzling it out, as opposed to admitting that this is going to be a half a a half a trillion U.S., which is something on the order of 30 trillion yen or something like that. It's a big number. Um, the, um, uh, instead of admitting it and, and, and having the Japanese people know that in the long haul they're going to spend an enormous amount of money cleaning this up, they drizzle it out. Every six months they say, well, here's another uh, 20 or 30 billion. But in fact, it's going to be a huge amount of money that the Japanese are going to have to eat. And the last thing is the um, contamination throughout Japan um, on the ground. Mm. We're finding um, house contamination in the form of household dust at extraordinarily high levels. Um, people are sending us their vacuum cleaner bags from, from Fukushima Prefecture. That's as, brilliant. As far as uh, 100 kilometers or 60 miles away, we're finding tens of thousands of disintegrations per second in a, in a kilogram va vacuum cleaner bag. So household dust, and of course the internal exposure that comes from it, uh, is something that the Japanese government is not talking about either. Yeah, it, it is electrifying to think that uh, you, this has been dismissed by the media. You don't see that as a concern anywhere, but uh, there were a couple of things you mentioned earlier uh, to me uh, today about uh, effects of earthquake perhaps wear on, on the reactor uh, itself. And I'm also thinking about something that Dave told me the other day, which was some, uh, a story about a boat recently up on, uh, that had come up on Vancouver, Vancouver Island. The, yeah, yeah, British Columbia coast, yeah. Well, go ahead with the, I'll talk to you about the, the condition of that building. Um, the, the Unit 4, you know, it, it's obvious it's a mess. I mean, if you look at it, it, it blew up. Um, and <laughs> Tokyo Electric has been saying, no, it's just fine. Although just recently, they, um, they've acknowledged that it's, a, uh, it's bulging in the middle. Um, and it's interesting, too, because where that bulge is located uh, indicates it's something called a first-mode Euler strut defect. And that means it's likely a seismic problem that came with the, uh, with the initial earthquake or perhaps one of the ones after that. So the, the net effect of this is that the, uh, the building has no containment. Um, all this nuclear fuel, hot nuclear fuel, in the fuel pool and is bulging on the sides. And uh, yet Tokyo Electric had a plan that was going to take four years to... Uh, uh, to remove the fuel. I mean, my God, we won World War II in less time than it's going to take them to defuel that uh, reactor. Well, you know, as Arnie points out, this pool is already showing signs of, of uh, failure. But, you know, in the United States, we have more room than they have in Japan. They have a lot of people in a small space. So when they designed that nuclear power plant, they didn't have a place on the ground to put the spent fuel or the waiting fuel in water in a pool on the ground. So this pool is over a hundred feet above the ground on top of the building. Now, you got to realize that nuclear metal, you know, is incredibly dense and incredibly heavy and um, the amount of weight up there 
that's being held on the racks, you know, holding all these rods up there, is an enormous amount of tonnage. And the way that they have to remove that fuel, no one really knows how to do yet because you can't ever let it get exposed to air or burst into flame. So they're going to have to somehow remove the racks of fuel rods, keep them immersed with a crane lifting this megatonnage of fuel rods somehow in water to get it down to somewhere that they think they can do something with. No one has ever done anything like this before. No one really knows how to do it yet. So that's why they're saying, well, it's going to take four years because we don't know how to do it yet. Sounds like we should call David Copperfield or something. He's probably got an idea about how you, you pull off a contortion like that. Is that something that, you, uh, that they even think about in the design stage of these plants, Arnie? Is that something that, that they take into consideration? Let's put the, the pool above ground. Is that, I mean... Well, <clears throat> There's uh, these. There's 23 plants in the U.S. that have the same problem, but the other 80 do not. So we learned this first generation plant uh, putting that that fuel way up in the air like that was a mistake. And the remaining 80 plants in the U.S. after we built those 23 have that uh, fuel pool much much lower and in a much more protected spot. And uh, and it's actually worse in the United States because the Japanese only put seven or eight years of nuclear fuel in their fuel pool. And uh, in the States, our, our fuel pools have more than 30 years of nuclear fuel in the pool. So uh, if there were to be a problem in a U.S. pool, um, it would release even more radiation than we're afraid will come out of Fukushima. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting where we're sliding the U.S. story in here in a, uh, a bit, and I think a lot of people here in California, guys, it's a beautiful day, we're in summer, you know, the gardens are going, and it's really easy to get distracted at the beach or something, but um, there was two weeks ago a really interesting short little AP clip that I, I came across that was talking about, and that's actually why I wrote you, Arnie, and, and uh, was wondering if you'd be available to talk, because there was this little clip I'd seen about uh, 1,200 cooling rods being uh, failing at uh, San Onofre. And um, that's where I think we, we should go maybe with the conversation. And we do have a video clip, um, a little uh, experiment that you just ran down there on site. And why don't you tell us just uh, uh, real briefly how you set the clip up, and then we'll go to the clip and share that with our viewers. Well, I, I was hired by Friends of the Earth to figure out why these, uh, these tubes inside the steam generator were failing. Um, and it's, it's, you can see these very complicated engineering drawings, and, and frankly, I thought we needed a better way of explaining what a U-tube steam generator looked like. So we put this video together on the beach, and we simulated U-tubes, and I got to show how, on, um, how they were banging into each other and causing the problems that is happening at San Onofre today. Awesome. Well, let's go to that clip, and we'll come right back to you uh, as soon as that's run.